All right, guys, I just wanted to go over the idea of a probability of a type 1 error if your class tests hypotheses the way my students do. So when my students are first learning hypothesis testing and they're doing these basic hypotheses where it's just a mean compared to a number, right, in those cases, I provide my students three scenarios because I allow my null hypothesis to not just be equal but also be less than or equal to possibly or greater than or equal to depending what the problem says. So if you're in a class where you restrict your null hypothesis to the equal case only, then you only need to worry about one case when you're trying to figure out the probability of a type 1 error. But in my classes, for my students, they need to consider three separate scenarios. Actually, in reality, we're going to see that it's really just two scenarios. So the scenarios are basically when the null hypothesis includes the actual equal sign, which means it's paired up against an alternative hypothesis where there's a not equal to sign. This is the only time in my classes that there's a probability of a type 1 error that's exactly equal to the alpha for the problem. So in every hypothesis testing problem, there's a significance level. It's often 5%, but it could be something else. But if it's 5%, like it is in this example, then the probability of a type 1 error is exactly 5%. Now in these other two cases, they're actually both the same in that the alternative hypothesis that's being used is basically indicating a right-tailed test or a left-tailed test, or in other words, just a one-tailed test. And in those scenarios, the probability of a type 1 error is less than or equal to the alpha for the problem. So what we're saying here is that the chance we commit a type 1 error in these two cases is going to be less than or equal to 5%. It won't be equal to 5%. It could be as high as 5%, but it's often less than that, depending on what's true in the real world, right? So remember, a type 1 error assumes that the null is true and you've rejected, right? That's what it means to have a type 1 error, that the null hypothesis was true, you came along, you tested that hypothesis, you rejected it in error, and that was a mistake, and they're asking, what's the probability you commit that mistake here? Well, in these cases where the null hypothesis isn't just a simple equal to, but rather it's a less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, then the probability of a type 1 error is at most a maximum of the alpha for the problem. And again, the alpha doesn't have to be 5%. It is here in my example but if it's 5%, then the probability of that type 1 error is less than or equal to 5%. And so again, hopefully your class has covered type 1 error and you've talked about the probability, but you might have heard your teacher say that it's actually equal to alpha always. Well, that's only true if your null hypothesis uses just the equal to case. If you have less than or equal to or greater than or equal to as your null hypothesis, then you must realize that the probability of a type 1 error changes and it becomes essentially a maximum of alpha, meaning it couldn't be any higher than that, but it could certainly be less than that. So anyways, with that in mind, um, really boils down to two cases. Either you see, you know, for HA not equal to, in which case you say the probability of a type 1 error is 5% or alpha, or you have the idea that your HA uses either greater than or less than, and then you would say probability of type 1 error is at most 5%. Again, this is all based on the idea that I allow my null hypothesis to be one of three cases. If you only have the one case in your class where you just use equal to, you can just remember this rule that the probability of a type 1 error is alpha. But if you're in a class that's like mine that allows two other cases for the null hypothesis, then you must realize that the probability of a type 1 error is less than or equal to alpha. Of course, as always, if you're taking a test in a professor's class, you want to ask about this because some professors just simplify things for their students and they just make it equal to 5% all the time. Again, not 5%, but alpha, right? Generically, whatever alpha is. I'm using 5% here because it's the most common alpha that's used, but it doesn't have to be 5%. Of course, it could be 1% or 10% or really any percent that you decide. But the point is, is that whatever alpha is, that's usually said to be the probability of a type 1 error, but that really is only true when your null hypothesis is something simple, like the mean is equal to 100. When it's you know essentially stating a range of values that the mean is either less than or equal to 100, so it could be anything what from 100 all the way down to whatever, in that scenario, then you have this probability of a type 1 error, which is less than or equal to alpha, and the same is true over here. So again, only in this special case where the null says the mean is equal to 100 do you have this probability of a type 1 error.
And again, in the other cases, it's a maximum of that alpha. That's an important thing to remember, especially if your teacher is going to ask you about it. I ask my students about both of these cases, and they need to be prepared to answer correctly the probability of a type 1 error, depending on which HO and HA pairing they're working with.